Hi, my name is Dr. John Diard, and welcome to LifeSpot.com, where we prove the ancient medical wisdom of Ayurveda with modern science. And today's podcast is all about Ayurvedic psychology. We just published a, a new course with Yoga Journal called Ayurveda 201, uh, all about Ayurvedic psychology. It's on the heels of our first Yoga Journal course called Ayurveda 101. And Ayurveda 101 was all about uh, living, eating, doing yoga, breathing and meditation, with the seasons, that, they, that the circadian rhythms of each season are dramatically different and our diet should change, our rhythms should change, our yoga should change, everything should change from one season to the next. And that was a, a course called Ayurveda 201, also done with Yoga Journal. Um, it was done like a year and a half ago and it, it's, it's a great course. I mean, I just love the idea that there's actually a course out there that people can get that actually connects them with Vedic science and circadian science and bringing those two together. That everything we should do should sort of dance with the rhythms of nature, circadian medicine, now Nobel Prize winning science, so like how cool is that? And that is now uh, something that you can do yoga, breathe, meditation, and there's a packet for winter, summer, and spring, and those are the three basic seasons. Of course, there's three seasons because there's three major harvests in nature, a spring harvest, a summer harvest, and an end of summer harvest for winter eating. Nature takes a, a season off, thank God, and takes a break. Every thing in nature is based on cycles of rest and activity, and that's the resting cycle, but that's why it's the three-season diet um, <clears throat> book that I wrote, um, and that's why uh, the, the course was set up to be for each of the three seasons. You get packets. So that was Ayurveda 101. It's a fantastic course. Why Ayurveda 101 is not a prerequisite for Ayurveda 201, but it's, a, it's an awesome course to, 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 uh, to get your hands on, and it's still available. We did Ayurveda 201 and Ayurveda 101 with uh, Larissa Hall Carson from uh, Kripalu's um, School of Yoga. She, Larissa was also the former dean of the Ayurveda College, where I've taught for decades at the Ayurvedic School in, uh, at Kripalu. And she's a dear friend, brilliant teacher, uh, brilliant yoga teacher. And um, so, so I do in the Ayurvedic psychology piece, I talk about, you know, the strategies of Ayurvedic psychology. And she um, demonstrates a lot of the yoga, breathing, and meditation techniques. So it's a really good combination. Uh, I think that you're going to love it. But why Ayurveda? <clears throat> why Ayurveda in psychology? You know, we think of Ayurveda as the body, but this is now all about psychology. What does the mind have to do with the body? Well, obviously it has to do with everything, right? So, so here's the thing, and, and this is, I'm gonna give you the, the model for the course and also give you some, some really good tools as well. If you read the Vedic literature, they tell you clearly what the whole thing's about. Uh, all Veda, and Veda means truth. So anything with a Veda at the end of it means truth. So Ayurveda is the truth of your life. We always think Ayur is life, Veda is science or truth. So it's the science of life, how to live in sync with the natural cycles, live downstream with the rhythms. That was Ayurveda 101. But Ayurveda 201 is the definition of Ayurveda, or Ayur is, Ayur, Ayur is life, and Veda is truth. So it's the truth of your life. How do we let that out? How do we let who you truly are out? And that is Ayurveda 201, Ayurveda psychology. And that's why I did that. Now, I um, came back from India in 1986. I went there for a two to three week vacation in 1986. And I uh, met one Ayurvedic teacher there who invited me to stay permanently, which I did. Stayed there for a year and a half met my wife, got married, uh, she was pregnant, we needed to leave India, I met Deepak Chopra, he was there opening up a Ayurvedic center in Massachusetts, he invited me to come and co-direct that center for eight years, and then from that point on, I had been administering Panchakarma Ayurvedic detox therapies for 26 years, until recently I closed that part of my life, um, and started doing more research and writing and videos and education and things like that, so that's what I do more now, as opposed to doing what I did before for 26 years, which is actually having hosting folks that would come from around the world to my Ayurvedic center here in Boulder. Also, when I, I was with Deepak for eight years and came here, opened up my own Ayurvedic Panchakarma Center, where I would sit with folks and go through, 
you know, a week or two of Ayurvedic retreat and detox with them. They would go into silence. They would do journal, journaling, uh, self-inquiry, critical analysis. They are elaborate Ayurvedic detox therapies. And what I was able to, to, to glean from all that was what Ayurveda was really all about. And as I was reading more of Ayurvedic textbooks, it's a never ending knowledge learning curve. It became very clear to me what Ayurveda was about. It actually says it right in the Bhagavad Gita in chapter two, verse 44, pretty sure. Um, it says that, it says, yoga sta kurukamani, which means first you establish being and then you perform action. It was based on the, the story that that uh, Arjuna, the great warrior, and Krishna, the great uh, sort of seer, uh, were, were going into battle against their cousins who sort of used uh, some trickery to gain control of the kingdom and were going to sort of destroy the kingdom and the people and they felt obligated to protect it. And Arjuna was like going into killing his cousins to kill the kids he played marbles with as a kid that he was gonna go take them out and he had this hesitation and said, hey, um, this is crazy. I, I'm not sure I want to go there and kill them. I love those guys, um, but they've done wrong, you know. And uh, and Krishna said, yoga sta kuru kamani, which means first you establish being, inner silence, and then you perform action. So the point of the whole story was you first must become more self-aware, establish the truth of you, the Ayurveda of you, and then take action from that place. And the book also goes on to say that we should not be attached to the fruits of our actions, which is also another important point that we talk about in Ayurvedic psychology, is how attached we are to the reward, the dopamine, the return on investment. How we, we do everything to make people like us, approve of us, appreciate us. We buy stuff to feel good. We eat to feel good. We are hardwired for this dopamine reward chemistry, but when it gets way out of whack and way out of sync, it causes some real problems. We become addicted to that reward. We become addicted to the attention. We become addicted to the outer, outside world. One of my favorite sort of Deepak Chopra quotes was that, uh, and I told my kids this recently, um, that, um, that we are, um, our cells, our inner cells are proportionally as void as intergalactic space, right? So that means that like, the stuff inside of us, the inner space is as void and as vast as the space out there. So like we should think about what's in there and not only be thinking about what's out there. Most of us aren't thinking about space, we're thinking about, you know, the stuff in my little local space. How can I get, buy, do, you know? And, uh, but there's a whole another world of quantum uh, awareness that I am enticing my kids to, and hopefully you too, to enjoy and, and, and begin to explore because it's what Ayurveda is really all about. When you pull back the bow, you establish that, that being and, and that silence. And when you are there for more self-aware and you take action and you release the bow and shoot the arrow from that place of deep inner stillness and silence, it's from the Ayurvedic perspective, it's a transformational experience. This is what Ayurveda calls Donar Veda. Donar Veda is the, 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 uh, the, the Veda of transformation, oftentimes talked about as the, the military Veda. Uh, there is no such thing as a Veda for killing things, okay? There's a Veda for transformation. Um, there's a, a Veda for uh, allowing you to engage in karmic transformational actions to free yourself from old patterns of behavior you may have created when you were younger. And that is what Ayurvedic psychology is really all about, right? So Ayurveda understood that the body <clears throat> can get really dense, and can get really toxic, it can get really thick, and you can get really dull. And that, um, it, therefore, it becomes very hard to see the forest through the trees. It becomes hard for us to become more self-aware, to see that the patterns of behavior that I'm engaging in um, are protective and repetitive. And I do the same dumb thing again and again and again in my life. I don't even realize I'm doing that. 
um, because I'm not self-aware. So Ayurveda was like, pull back the bow, establish being, become more still and more self-aware, and then start training yourself to take action from that deep place. And that's one of the models that we use in the yoga journal, Ayurveda Psychology or Ayurveda 201 Psych Ayurvedic Psychology course, which is all about you know, understanding how do we pull back that bow? How do we gain more inner awareness and more inner silence and become more peaceful and more calm? So Ayurveda was a system of medicine that was really designed to do what? To, to, to take the density of the physical body and make it light, um, to enhance self-awareness, to make the body uh, more clear, so it can see through the density and see more clearly into that inner space. Uh, because when it's all clogged up and cloudy and the glass is dirty, you can't see inner space, so all you do is you look at outer space, and we become completely fascinated by outer space, right? And this, in this day and age, with, with the technology, you know, being on steroids, um, and particularly technology um, and so social media being aimed at our most weak uh, predispositions, which is our psychology. You know, what, what, um, what social media companies have figured out is that if I, you know, can give you an app to make you look prettier, you're going to love, that's going to be all day long. We're going to keep trying to make ourselves look prettier. If I give you an app that gives you reward, like more likes and more likes and give you, give you rewards for getting more likes, you're going to want to do more of that. But it also goes the other way. It, you know, social media has a way of, you know, and this is tapping into the, our worst, some of our worst traits as humans is where we can kind of criticize other people in a negative way. If someone looks bad on social media, they, they get laughed at, they're, they're, they're criticized, humiliated. And that also creates a, an emotional charge. And people sometimes, like. I mean, in the old days, people would go and watch hangings, if you can believe that. That's like so gross. But those same humans are here today laughing at people who are getting criticized or bullied on social media, right? So the technology companies have tapped into something that really draws on our on our our our, our not so the not so wonderful part of us as humans and it's made us more addicted to this outside world hopefully hopefully the pendulum has shifted to such an extent that we all des are so desiring to come back to 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 explore inner space which is extremely extremely real even, uh, you know, there's a book written not too long ago about called The Return of Superman, where all these elite athletes would do extreme sports and they measure their brain waves. And they found that when they do these extreme things, their brain waves go into alpha and their brain waves coherence and they're like super locked into whatever they're doing and they have this incredible euphoria experience. Well, the exact same brain, and then they talk about in the book how a lot of these guys in these extreme sports are dead and died doing it. And then they talk about later in the book, if you finish the book, they say that a lot of these extreme athletes, when they get older into their 40s and 50s, they can't do those extreme things anymore, become really seriously depressed. Why? Because they can't rep replicate the juice anymore. Well, well I wrote a book in, in, uh, a long time ago, the, uh, the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, called Body Mind and Sport. And we did brainwave research. Um, <coughs> excuse me, we did brainwave research and we found that when you breathe through your nose and you exercise, it's all about exercising and trying to get the runners high in the zone, that we produce the same exact brainwaves that these elite athletes, extreme athletes were producing, you know, risking their lives um, in meditation, exploring inner space, um, and doing vigorous exercise using nose breathing uh, to actually facilitate a neurological calm. So the point of Ayurvedic psychology is for us to create a, a bigger eye of the storm, a bigger inner experience of composure and calm, right? So the bigger the eye of the storm, the more powerful the winds, right? So if we can figure out a way to, to, to expand our inner silence, pull back the bow and become more self-aware, establish being, establish silence, and then perform action, shoot the arrow, take action, live, breathe, and, and experience life 
from the window and, and, and of this experience of composure and calm, you've mastered the Vedic principle. And that principle is called the coexistence of opposites, where you begin to have the experience of dynamic activity and composure and calm at the same time. Now, when I first started out my journey um, back in my 20s, and I was fascinated by Ayurvedic medicine, and I was fascinated by athletics and sports and definitely the runner's high, uh, um, my first <clears throat> book that I carried around with me for years was called The Psychic Side of Sports by Michael Murphy, all about these reports of you know, psychic, euphoric, runner's high experiences that athletes had. And Roger Bannister said that when he broke the four minute mile, which no one could ever break, they couldn't break it, couldn't break it, he broke it finally. And he said, when I broke that, I felt like I was running slow. I felt like um, the world didn't even exist. He said, I felt no pain and no strain, yet he was running faster than any man alive. Billie Jean King, who did the forward to my book, and uh, one of my favorite people on the planet, by the way, um, said that I would transport myself beyond the turmoil of the court to a place of total peace and calm. If you don't know Billie Jean King, she's one of the most decorated tennis players of all time. So how do you transport yourself beyond the, the turmoil of the court to a place of total peace and calm? That's by tapping into the eye of the storm, that inner experience of composure and calm. And that in Ayurveda 201 is what we're all about. We teach you with yoga, breathing, and meditation to pull back the bow, establish being, and then perform action from that deep place. And I'm going to talk more about, about how that course is laid out. It's so beautifully laid out uh, in a way that's never been laid out before. And I want to share that with you in just a second. But, but I want to talk a little bit about more about, about the, the, um, the, the idea that, that sports, for me, was a model for teaching me how to handle a stressful situation from a calm place. And the runner's high was my best race, is my easiest race. Learning how to handle your life stress from a calm place, that's what Veda was all about. That's what Ayurveda is all about. That's what Ayurvedic psychology is all about. And, and by tapping into that inner experience of composure and calm, you're allowed to and able to focus in and not be distracted by the outside world. You know, how many of us these days are so distracted by the outside world? We're so good at multitasking, we can't do anything, any one thing good. We're sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. You know, a, you know, a, a jack of all trades but a master of none, remember those sayings? Those are all sayings that suggest that you, until you dig a hole deep, you don't get it. And the one hole that we don't dig deep, maybe we dig my job hole deep or my, my, you know, my sports hole deep, but what about your relationships hole deep? What about your inner space hole deep? These kinds of things we tend to ignore. Why? Because our body has become, in a way, weathered by stress, dense, become dense by stress, become lack of awareness by stress. So the Ayurvedic 201 Ayurvedic psychology course is all about creating more awareness, and then teaching you how to take action from that deep place. So there's sort of two roadmaps we use in the course that I think are just beautiful. Um, and the first roadmap is understanding your emotional body type, your Ayurvedic emotional body type. Are you more sattvic? Are you more rajasic? Or are you more tamasic? So what does that mean? When you're sattvic, you um, you, you, you love for no reason. You give for no reason. You care for others because it's your nature to do so. You don't need love from the outside world because you are love. You don't need what you already are. Uh, being a sattvic human being means that you, that you prefer peace over, over war. Uh, we're not trying to, trying to uh, beat, compete, outperform uh, another person. I wrote about in my book, Body, Mind, and Sport, that what competition is from the Vedic perspective is not beating and winning and only about winning. It's about who could, who could, through the competition, be less distracted by the competition. 
create an inner experience of composure and calm, a bigger eye of the storm, a bigger union of mind and body, a yoga that takes place. So when you're in that competition, you're so focused on what you're doing, you're not distracted by the outcome. That is winning. My best, one of my best stories of that is, is uh, when, and I wrote it in my book, uh, Body, Mind and Sport, was when Ben Hogan, one of the greatest golfers of all time, was hitting sink, was playing a tournament and it was the 18th hole and he had one more putt to sink, but it was a very, very long putt and everybody's there gathered around and, and it was super quiet and as he pulls the putt back, as he pulls the putt back to, uh, to swing the putt, as he starts to swing, a train comes by and blows the whistle. I mean like really loud, the train tracks were like right there and blew the whistle, everybody was like, oh, they couldn't believe it. And uh, he hits the ball and the putt rolls down the green and sinks the putt, wins the tournament, people go crazy, they couldn't believe it. And in the interview after the tournament, they walk up to Mr. Hogan, Mr. Hogan, oh my God, that was so amazing. And one reporter goes, what did you think when that train came by and blew its whistle? And he looked up and he was like, what whistle, what train? He didn't hear any of it because he was so completely focused. That is winning, whether you sunk the putt, putt or not, he was not distracted by the competition. That, in my mind, that's winning. That's what competition is for. Not just to beat the other guy and pulverize the other team into the ground, it's to give them uh, an experience of truth. The truth of you, the Ayurveda of you. This reminds me of so many stories. I'll tell you one more. Um, when I first wrote Body, Mind, Sport, uh, we started teaching these principles of nose breathing and sports to some private schools around the country. And um, I can tell you so many stories, but this one story was on the track team, and uh, or sorry, it was the soccer team. And our little school was sort of a not very good soccer team, it was a terrible soccer team. So this really great soccer team came into town and uh, um, pulverized our kids. Um, as they expected. And, um, but our kids were breathing through their nose and they were enjoying the process, which is all part of it, not the goal, but the process and just getting the, and they were getting better. So they were really happy about their, their season because they were getting better and they were enjoying it. And they were getting, you know, beat up emotionally and were, you know, depressed because they were losing so many games. They were sort of on this journey and the gains in the process versus the goal, right? And they were doing this. So our guys were having such a good experience getting beat um, and having such a great that at the end of the game, our guys were like celebrating and the other team was so frustrated that our guys were celebrating after they just got clobbered that, this is a true story, that the other team got so angry and so irritated, they literally challenged our team to a rematch just so they could just pulverize them and make them feel bad, which was really not gonna happen because these kids weren't about the goal, they were about the process. I get it, winning's great, and, and our culture's all about winning, and it's nothing like winning, right? It's great. But winning and how you win, it makes all the difference. That was my, what my book, Body, Mind, Sport, was all about. It was changing, trying, I didn't succeed by any means. I tried to change the culture way back then, that was way back in the early 90s, um, late 80s when I wrote that book. Right, so, so, and it was all about like, how can we become, you know, um, you know, there's an old saying in, in Ayurvedic medicine called invincibility. Uh, and I mean, my first course through Nightingale Conant was a tape series on athletics called Invincible Athletics. And I wrote it because, because when you're invincible, you're impenetrable. And when you are, putting all your eggs in the basket of winning or losing, you're gonna win and be successful or lose and be unsuccessful. So you're very, very vulnerable, 50-50 chance, you're, gonna, you're not gonna feel good at the end of that. So you put all this energy into it and you then lose, it's sort of crazy, right? But when you're invincible, you're impenetrable. And if you're focusing on the process and that coordination of mind and body, not being distracted by that outcome, you're a winner because you've connected and that gives you access to yourself and that access to yourself is your love, your joy, your kindness, your giving. And I can go on and on. The science behind having that experience is awesome. It's off the charts. I mean, your oxytocin, longevity, health, loving, bonding, giving hormone surges. Your, 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 your reward hormones decline, which makes shorten your life. 
Epigenetically, we literally change the genetic structure when we give and love and care for others. The telomeres in our brain, which measure longevity, lengthen. The microbiome loves love. It hates stress. The microbiome literally alters and changes when you give and care and take care of others. So when you're engaged in a competition, you're stressing, 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 and it's just war, but you don't connect with the yoga style Kuru Kamani, which Arjuna was about, First establish being and then perform action and take that into competition, take that into your life, take that into your relationships. That's what this whole thing is about. And that's powerful. And, you know, it, it, it applies to sports. It applies to your relationships. You know, I, I, I give seminars. I've been giving seminars on Ayurvedic psychology for many decades now, I think. Um, and I would ask my, my students, um, how many of you love your husband, your spouse, your partner? Everybody sort of raises their hand and says, yeah, I do. And I go, how many of you find yourself holding back loving and giving and caring for your, your loved ones? And they all raise their hand again. I'm going like, whoa, wait, why? Why do you find yourself holding back giving your love fully to your partner? The person that you, you know, theoretically have, have given your life to and dedicated your life to, devoted your life to, it's your life partner, let's say. But you don't love them fully, you hold back. Like, what's up with that? Why do we do such a thing? And that is a really great question to have you kind of sink in for a little while. You know, my husband, I don't know, he's not on the same path, he watches the game, he drinks some beer, you know, I'm on a spiritual path, stuff like that. And therefore, we find ourselves judging them. We find ourselves saying in our head, if they would just stop doing X, Y, or Z, then I would love them a whole lot more. So what we're saying is that if they change, then I will be my wonderful loving self. Really, okay? And if they don't change, you never get to be your true self in this life, which is sort of on the very short side of things. You know, I mean, I, I, I had a personal experience of that when I came back from India and we, I was married with my wife. We, six children. Um, I didn't uh, know how to do that, um, nor did I, was I ever married before. So it was sort of like, didn't know how to do that either. And, um, and I think we all go through that in, in the early part of our relationship where you go, God, I wish he or she would do a little more of this and do a little more of that or stop doing this or stop doing that. And, um, and I would go, God, you know, we had a great relationship. We were super compatible. But, I, but in the back of my head, there was just this little voice saying, God, if this would be different, you know, it would be better. And then as I was getting into my inner space using yoga, breathing, and meditation, I started to become more self-aware. It dawned on me. This is what happens in Ayurvedic psychology. It dawns on you that it's you, you jerk. It's your behavior that you can change, and it has nothing to do with them, right? So we're all like, if they would stop, you know, reading, the, you know, or, or you know, um, you know, watching the game or whatever, then I would love them more. And I realized that that it was me that was chicken, didn't have the courage to take a risk to open the very delicate petals of my flower and let who I am out, right? And if I were to give myself fully to somebody and love them fully, what if they didn't love me back? What if they rejected me? What if they didn't do what I thought they should do? I would be sort of out there on a limb, emotionally vulnerable and therefore hurt. So the mind has a thing, it's called the great barrier sheath, which is all about making sure you never get hurt feelings. And it's like the mind's like, like balancing. It always wants to balance it out. And if you get hurt feelings, you're going to create an emotional response to that hurt feeling. And you're going to store that emotional response as a molecule of emotion in your fat and your brain and your blood and your muscle, according to Ayurveda, that's going to be registered and stored. And it's going to, as a result of that trigger, um, you know, a, a, a pre-recorded response to any stress down the road. So if anybody comes and tries to gives you a similar type of stress, you're going to have a a pre-recorded stress response to that, and then therefore do the same dumb thing again and again and again. I always say, if you go home for the holidays and you start interacting with relatives and parents and brothers and sisters, all of a sudden you're triggered, right? You're acting like a four or five year old again. You wonder like, what the heck happens when I go home? Those are pre-recorded responses. One study showed that we produce 
that 95% of the things that we think and say and do as young children, uh, or as adults rather. So 95% of the things we think and say and do as adults, right, come from experiences we experience in the first six years of our life. So we are projecting on the screen old protective patterns based on old impressions from the first six years of life. We project them on the screen in the name of hopefully being coming safe and secure and feeling uh, hopefully loved and appreciated and approved. And if we don't get that, we get hurt feelings, we create an emotional response, maybe a little passive aggressive, and then I store that in my fat cells and I remotely then use that stress response to do the same dumb thing again and again whenever I come into contact with someone who's a little bit threatening or a little bit uh, challenging to me. So this is the kind of the journey that we take you on and, and um, is kind of a, a discussion and understanding of how you can become more self-aware of the patterns of behavior that you may have created as a young kid, that may have served you wonderfully as a young kid, that was probably perfection as a young kid, but now as an adult, not serving you any longer. You watch yourself holding back the love that you have for your own spouse, your own partner, the one that you love the most, you're not loving fully. So now we're in a relationship where we don't actually feel safe enough to even love the ones we love fully. Even our kids, we hold back, you know what I mean? So this is the journey of Ayurvedic psychology is to get you locked into that inner space, create that inner experience of composure and calm. So you can do that thing deeply, dig that one hole super deep, love fully, give fully, not just give a little with a hope to get something in return or be distracted by a million things, you never have to dig that hole deep. And when you dig that hole deep, you're going to confront some of your fears, right? Of course, uh, some of your inhibitions, some of the reasons why your mind said, don't give fully because they may not love you back. So you bump up against that, but that's the, the, the game of life, I love to call it. In, in Ayurveda, they call it the great battle. You know, they use metaphors like battles, which is why Donner Bay was considered the military Veda. It's not a battle. It's a, it's a war, I guess you could say, but I like to think of it as a game that we get to play in our side of our own head and inside of our own heart. Who do we let drive the chariot? Do we let this mind who needs to be appreciated and loved and supported all the time, social media-esque, or do we let the heart who we truly are out taking that risk to be more vulnerable and more delicate? So let me tell you a little bit about how the course works. There's two roadmaps that we use in this course, which I think are just super awesome. One, we talked about it, the sattvic uh, mindset. And when you become more stimulated and you need love and need appreciation, we look for the mind to give us that reward, that solution. And that is to, you know, video games, buying things, eating things, coffee, tea, running, exercise, yoga, many things can be stimulating and then be tend potentially even addictive um, and therefore are sort of the thing that fuels us. And, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with rajasic behavior, which is what that is when you stimulate yourself. But when you become overly rajasic, where you can't be comfortable in your own skin alone and still, then you've moved into a, a rajasic behavior where you've lost aspects of yourself. You've lost the eye of the storm, and now you're dancing around refrigerators in Winnebago's in big, huge tree stumps in the winds of the hurricane, and you're dodging them, and it's very dangerous, right? Where if you had, if you could hail from the eye of the storm, the bigger the calm, the more powerful the winds, the more productive you are in your life, right? It's a whole different animal, right? That's the runner's high thing. My best race is my easiest race. How do they feel that peace and calm in the midst of all this dynamic activity? It's the mind being still, but the body being dynamic activity. Another word for that is called yoga, a union. It's all about creating the coexistence of opposites. In my book, Body, Mind, Sport, we produced, we did brainwave research, which we published in the International Journal of Neuroscience, and we found that when people, medit when people meditate, their brainwaves go into alpha. But we showed that people can go into alpha and brainwave coherence during vigorous exercise, and that was an unprecedented finding. No one had ever replicated you know, alpha and brainwave coherence during vigorous exercise before. So it was really quite fascinating, right? So the so when you become overstimulated and you're out there dodging refrigerators in the winds of the storm, 
you start to realize this is super dangerous. You become overstimulated, depleted, adrenal fatigue. You want to start to retreat, withdraw, protect, and, and, and armor up a little bit more. And that's what we call tamasic behavior, hiding away in the box of cocoon, drinking, you know, getting high, getting wasted, checking out of reality versus rajasic behavior, checking in, but being addicted to the stimulation versus sattvic behavior, checking into your inner space, rajasic checking in and getting quite a fascinated, maybe even addicted to your outer space and tamasic behavior, sort of trying to seek out no space. You just want to like check out completely. So the first roadmap we use in our course, and it's a six week course that we have, every week we have a different program. In the first week, uh, we talk about how with yoga and breathing and meditation, Ayurvedic psychology techniques to go from sattvic, uh, uh, tamasic behavior back through the uh, rajasic behavior and then becoming more sattvic. So we give you a questionnaire in the beginning. We find out exactly where you are more tamasic in your behavior, where you are more rajasic in behavior. And then we start choosing um, strategies to bring yourself back from tamasic to rajasic to sattvic. And so it's an absolutely beautiful roadmap. And uh, Larissa takes you through the yoga, the breathing, the meditation, all that in such a beautiful way to break up those tamasic qualities of density and withdraw and with retreat and depression and hiding and armoring up. She breaks down that armor with yoga, breathing and meditation techniques specifically for the tamasic qualities that we all have. And then as we move into the rajasic behavior, we, 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 she has another set of yoga, breathing and meditation program to help unravel the, st the tendency for us, for our mind to be so stimulated by the outside world. So, so set on getting the reward and, and having to be liked and approved of and appreciated to feel good in our skin or to be buying stuff or getting stuff from the outside world and dialing that down to some sense of balance using specific rajasic um, balancing yoga breathing meditation techniques. And then of course, finally, in the last weeks, we teach you how to do yoga breathing and, and meditation in a sattvic way to really explore and expand that inner space, that inner silence, that inner eye of the storm as sattvic behavior. And that's the first roadmap that we track throughout the six week course. The second roadmap that we track week to week throughout the six week course are the koshas, the shis, the, the, the subtle energy shis of the body and, and how we can use them to remove the density of the body and create heightened awareness of the mind to allow the truth of who you truly are out. So the first subtle body sheath or kosha is called the Ananda Maya Kosha, which is the bliss sheath, which is, you know, think about that as the, the deep uh, uh, love and, and, and delicate nature of your heart and how we sort of armor that up. The second sheath, um, we do that with our mind, by the way. Um, the second sheath is the, um, the Vigyana Maya Kosha or the, the wisdom sheath, which is a sheath that um, is what we call the discernment sheath. Think of the, the petals of a lotus flower that open and close, um, you know, depending on the weather and the storm and the danger that might be out there. So that's the discernment sheath, still full of light, like a flower and love and caring and giving, but it has the ability to close up. So that's the second sheath. But on the outside, <coughs> excuse me, on the outside of that sheath is what's called the great barrier sheath. It's the big wall that we put up between our mind, our monomaya kosha, and the wisdom sheath or the vigyana maya kosha, the discernment sheath. So there's a big protective barrier between the mind and your heart. And that's the one we're after. We're after penetrating that barrier, penetrating that armor. And once you penetrate that armor, really cool things happen. Uh, you begin to allow the, the, the bliss, the love, the caring. You let the, you find somehow, somewhere, the courage to take action, to let the very delicate petals of your flower open and let who you truly are out. The mind, not all about that. The mind's all about mathematics and everything I do for you has to return an investment, right? And the heart's all about physics, just wants to give and expand and love. But the mind's like, mm, that ain't happening. So the mind is all about 
protection and control and using the senses to stimulate you, to get you distracted and attracted by the senses going in an outer direction. But Ayurveda says the senses also go inward. They go into outer space and they go into inner space. And that's what Ayurveda says. So we teach you techniques in the Ayurveda 201 Ayurveda psychology course where we teach you how to use your senses to go within and become more self-aware. And then once with that self-awareness, pull back that bow, we teach you how in later lessons how to take action from that, um, that place. So the, so, and then the, the next sheath is the, um, that's the mind and the mind is really the, the component of us that gets us into the most trouble and the mind impacts the function of the subtle energy, the prana, which is the next outer layer sheath called the prana maya kosha. And the prana maya kosha is the life force. It's the air. It's the breath. And it's the breath that, that connects the mind and the body. You think about, um, you know, they, they put the prana maya kosha between the mind sheath, the mono maya kosha, and the most outer sheath, which is now not subtle body anymore. It's physical body. And that's the ana maya kosha, or the physical body sheath. So guess what's in between the body and the mind in the kosha system is the prana, the life force, your chi, your energy. And yoga and breathing are designed to move that, uh, that life force and push that life force, that prana, into the mind to create heightened awareness of the mind and also push into the density of the physical body and bring the body back into balance. We also talk about how the body just gets dense and how Ayurveda is such an important part. And we also have Ayurveda 101 for that, but also Ayurveda, uh, the Anamaya Kosha, we talk about doing cleansing, a uh, four-day detox. There's herbs for every week of the course to kind of unravel the protective patterns of your mind and let who you truly are out. There's a four-day detox that we guide you through in the process. There's foods. Uh, lifestyle, diet, behavior, yoga, breathing, meditation for each of the koshas. And we start with the physical body first. So the first week is all about breaking down and cleaning and purifying the physical body, the anamaya kosha. And the second one is specifically for the pranamaya kosha, using yoga, breathing, meditation, and other tools, herbs, lifestyle, diet, to, to purify the pranamaya kosha and drive prana into the physical body and that when the body becomes light with energy, sort of that, that sometimes that vibration you feel after a yoga class, that's the prana trying to pound away at the density of your physical body. So we use those tools and then, then, then we then move into the monomaya kosha where we use more Ayurvedic psychology tools to create more heightened awareness of the mind. And when the body is more aware and less dense, and the prana is now moving freely into the body and into the mind, the mind becomes more clear. And then the, the, the junction point between the, between the, um, the, 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 the three koshas, the, the body, the anamaya kosha, the body, the pranamaya kosha, the life force prana, and the uh, monomaya kosha, the mind, those three um, are juxtaposed right up against the vijnanamaya kosha, the lotus petal flower that's full of prana and love and bliss, and the anamaya kosha, the bliss sheets itself. So there's a separation between the bliss and the density of the physical body. And that junction point is where we want to put our attention. And that's by, and then you go there by putting your attention to the pain, to the discomfort, to the fear. But it's way easier when you have the awareness of the body is not dense and struggling and stress, the prana is moving freely, the mind is still, then the, 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 you know, the glass becomes clear. You can see very clearly the older patterns of behavior. And when you put your attention at that place between the junction point, between the pure bliss and consciousness and the mind, which is like holding on for dear life, you can bring your attention into the mind and you can bring your attention into the bliss because you're at the point where the two meet. And that's where meditation lives. That's where yoga lives. That's where self-inquiry, Ayurvedic psychology, called critical analysis in the Vedic text, lives. So we, we bring the, 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 the koshas into balance so the natural awareness goes to the junction point between your bliss and your mind, mental, physiological state. And by bringing your attention there, the awareness 
can shine both into the physical body, the mind, and the emotions, but also into the pure awareness, the bliss, the pure consciousness, right? So it sounds a little bit crazy um, to talk like that, but this is how healing works from the Vedic perspective. Everything in Veda was about restoring the memory of pure consciousness or bliss into every cell of the body, bringing sattva into every cell of the body. And how do you do that? Well, you go right to where the sattva and the density meet. You go right to where the consciousness and the physiology meet. You go right to where the where that where the bliss and the mind and the physiology meet. And that's right there in the koshas, which is why we use this model, which is so critically important. So this is also interesting and, and is something that I want to share with you, that, that, that healing from the Vedic perspective always takes place by restoring the memory of pure consciousness into the density of the physical body. That's the name of the game. Well, now we have these things called biophotons, photons of light, that we emit and receive in our body constantly. And these photons of light are photons. Photons, by definition, are both particles of light and waveforms of light. So they are the, the, the fundamental uh, quantum particle that is both, by definition, field and physiology, both consciousness and matter together. So when you put your attention at the junction point between the Vigyana Maya Kosha and the Mono Maya Kosha, and the physical Kosha, the Prana Kosha, and the mental Kosha are balanced, and the prana, the life, the bliss is, is waiting patiently, and you put your attention on the great barrier sheath where it all joins, and you shine that awareness into the bliss and into the density of the physical body, you're putting your attention on the place where the biophotons literally live, exist. And these biophotons have now been shown in the studies. I've written a lot about this lately in my website, in my newsletters. The biophotons have been shown to carry information throughout our body and carry information over vast distances at the speed of light. Einstein called them spooky action at a distance. Quantum healing is exactly that, is that, the, that these biophotons um, can actually carry information. And the newest, latest science shows that these biophotons can be charged or impregnated with intention. So your intention can change and alter these biophotons, which can they be carried at the speed of light at great distances within your body or even to through, through prayer and things like that, uh, distance healing type techniques whether we know the absolute science of how that works or how we can replicate it or not, we do have now a mechanism in the scientific world to prove the Vedic concept that healing can take place. And we're not talking about just healing stuff like body, physical stuff, but healing your mind first. We have to bring the mind and the body and the prana back into balance, create that heightened awareness in the physical body, and then bring the attention to that place. And that's where the yoga and the breathing and meditation is there. And then when you're there, you engage in self-inquiry. Self-inquiry is the critical analysis where you then pull back that bow, become self-aware of the old patterns of behavior that you created as a young kid that aren't serving any longer, and then you take action and free yourself from that old pattern of behavior. We have in our, in our culture, yoga, breathing, meditation, we really got the first half of the equation, which is to establish being, right? We get that. But who is teaching you how to take action? to pull back that bow and shoot the arrow and free yourself from those old patterns of behavior. That is what Vedic science is really truly all about. And that's what Ayurvedic Psychology 201, Ayurveda 201, Ayurvedic Psychology course with Yoga Journal and my dear friend Yoga um, Larissa uh, Hall Carlson and myself uh, teach. Uh, it's available now, uh, just released on Memorial Day. So it's just been released. It's called Ayurveda 201, Ayurvedic Psychology. It's published and produced and put out by Yoga Journal. So please don't miss this one. This is maybe the best course I've ever done. Um, it will take you on a journey. And uh, I look forward to taking that journey with you. This one is uh, definitely one you don't want to miss. All right. Well, thank you all for joining me. And I uh, hope you enjoy the Ayurvedic Psychology course, Ayurveda 201. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Duyard. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share.
This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.